That's kind of what we're working on here. Rodent, the model's a mouse. Of course, they're mammals. 88% of the genes are common. The most highly developed mammals are the primates, whole world monkeys, macaques, rhesus monkeys. 93% of our genes are common with theirs. Of course, the most highly developed primate are the chimpanzees. Detailed analysis of the coding regions, chimpanzees versus humans, also front cover of Nature in 05. They looked at the coding DNA only, exons. You and I, the chimpanzee, 98.7 identical. By the way, folks, you and me, two normal humans, 99.9. Average two normal people, 0.1% difference in our DNA sequence. You and I in a chimp, 98.7. So we're thinking about 1.3% of our genome must be responsible for unique characteristics that we have chimpanzees do not, like brain size. Ours is about three times larger. Also, the outside neocortical region of the brain, that out, much more complicated, much more uh, elaborate in the human brain. There must be something in that 1.3% responsible for that. Uh, must be something in that 1.3% that permits you and I to walk upright. Must be something there that gives us extra dexterity, more flexibility, hands and fingers. And of course there must be something in that 1.3% that permits you and I to communicate through speech. If we can talk and monkeys can, there must be some speech genes in that 1.3%. I'll give you a couple references. This first one's in your school library. It's four years old now, but still really good. Has this fascinating picture. It's Time Magazine. Check Time Magazine, October 9th. There's a big article on what makes us different from chimpanzees. Here in September 14th of 06 is a new way to do comparative genomics, compare chimps to humans. Look for what's called an HAR. HAR is the abbreviation for Human Accelerated Region. That's a region of human DNA where the sequence is significantly different between humans and chimps. There's been accelerated change in that sequence in the human. And we think, of course, that's meaning positive uh, rapid selection for the trait that goes with that DNA. We now have 18 of those that computers picked out. This is telling about HAR number one. Turns out the gene does not make a protein, it makes RNA, so it's a non-coding gene. But look when this gene is working. In the outside neocortical region of the developing human fetal brain during the seven to 19th weeks of pregnancy, the exact weeks when the neocortex of our brain is becoming so much more complicated than that of a chimp. So of course we're predicting HAR1 is in that 1.3% and responsible for uh, our neocortical region on the outside of the brain. Now here's Scientific American last May. This is almost certainly in your school library. What makes us human at 1.3%? It looks at HAR. People, let me tell you how sophisticated this is. The computer compared human DNA to chimp DNA, nucleotide for nucleotide, 2.85 billion, picked out 118 nucleotides out of 2.85 billion. Those 118 in a bird compared to a chimp, bottom compared to the middle, two changes took place in that sequence of events. From chimpanzees to humans, that sequence changed 18 times. That's a highly accelerated rate of change, looking at rapid positive selection for the traits. And again, for humans, that looks like the outside neocortical region of your brain. In the same magazine, this list of six different human genes, part of that 1.3%, uh, HAR1, we just talked about, there at the top, cortex of the brain. FOXP2 is the speech gene. It's a transcription factor that affects the developing face of a human fetus. 
tongue, lips, cheeks, larynx, vocal cords, permits us to manipulate our mouth in such a way we can make sounds and communicate by speech. So that's the main speech gene. Amy1 is for amylase. That's an enzyme in your uh, saliva that helps digest carbohydrates. So that gives us uh, more diversity in our diet. Aspen, the fourth one, is connected to brain size, our much larger brain size. We'll come back to that in a minute. LCT is lactase for lactose, digestion of uh, lactose, sugar, in the, in the intestine, and again, more diversified diet. And HAR number two there at the bottom is uh, the second HAR that was picked up by the computer, and that affects your wrists, hands, and fingers. Look at Fox P2. Second one, let me show you a family tree. Everybody here had experience uh, looking at a pedigree, human pedigree, where the boxes are males, the circles are females. Anybody with an abnormal phenotype is blacked in. Look at this family tree. See the mutation is in black. It's a dominant gene passing through multiple generations. So what's the abnormal phenotype that affects all the people in this pedigree? It's intriguing. All the people blacked in are unable to speak. What's the mutation, FOXP2? See, that's the gene that gives you and I the ability to speak, but in a human family, that gene doesn't work. Those people revert back to a chimpanzee-like condition. They can't speak either. That makes sense? Yeah. One group recently compared fox P2 with a human to fox P2 with a chimp. How much difference? Two amino acids. Two amino acids in one protein means you and I can talk and they cannot. One group recently put the human gene for fox P2 in the fertilized egg of a mouse. When the mice were born and grew to adulthood, they were not able to talk, but they were able to make unique vocalizations a normal mouse cannot make. It did have an effect. For the underclassmen here, junior, sophomores, freshmen, I think the neat experiment would be put the human gene for Fox P2 in the fertilized egg of a chimpanzee. And of course, I'm talking about science fair project for next year. <laughs> Here's Aspen. Brain size, now let me explain this. Aspen, when the gene works normally, creates a normal sized brain like you see here, your brain and mine, cross section, sagittal section. Here's the tricky part. The gene is named for the mutation. When the gene mutates, what happens? It causes abnormal spindle-like microcephaly. Small head, small brain, severe retardation. So the normal brain, the normal gene is named for what happens when it mutates. Let me show you what happens. Coming up on the left for comparison. This is an adult human brain. Not a child, not a baby, adult. Aspen was not working on the left. Everybody see it or do you want me to say it? That gene doesn't work. A human is born with a brain the size of a chimpanzee. It's about one third normal size. Fox P2 doesn't work. Humans can't speak. Make sense? Yeah? Yes. Those people without Fox P2 do have some mental, it's not severe retardation, but they're slow. By the way, if you don't know, folks, this whole story, the human ancestral family, got a little more complicated the first week of October. If you didn't see it, let me tell you. It's the cover article of Science, October 2nd, last fall. Introducing Artie. A new species, Artipithecus ramidus, a new ancestor of ours. I get this. Details came from a 4.4 million year old female skeleton found in a cave in Ethiopia. They found 
the skeleton 15 years ago, and experts have been working on it for 15 years. So all the different scientists working on this from different angles published all their papers after 15 years on the same day. So October 2nd, science, there were 11 papers about Hardy. And the most significant point? Might have been more sophisticated than chimpanzees, Ardipithecus walked upright. So, the whole story got a little more interesting in October. <clears throat> Let's add this to the story. The summer of 1856, 154 years ago in Germany, there were a few miners working in a quarry outside a large city along a river, and they stumbled upon 16 very unique and unusual bones. One of the miners had a unique scientific curiosity and took the bones to a friend of his who was an anthropologist at Feldhofer University. That's the nearby town. The friend who was the anthropologist was absolutely stunned. He'd never seen bones like these before. They were unequivocally human bones, but primitive ancestral human bones. Found for the first time over 150 years ago along the Neander River Valley of Germany. The name that was assigned to those bones, of course you can guess, Neanderthal. And if you don't know folks, the Neanderthal Genome Project is almost finished. Headed up by Dr. Pablo in Germany, in the picture which is in that Time Magazine article I mentioned, he's holding the skull from a 38,000 year old Neanderthal male found in a cave near Croatia. And that skeleton is being used to reconstruct the DNA to do the genome project. There's one of the long bones in the body where they're extracting DNA from the bone. The initial results were published in November of 06. The first one million nucleotides, front cover of nature, Neanderthal genomics. So what would you guess? You and I in a chip, 98.7, you and I are 99.9. Neanderthals are direct human ancestors. Initial results looks like 99.5. Final results ought to be out any time, so be on the lookout for that. You may be hearing about it before school's out. Scientific American, again in your school library last August, how the Neanderthals disappeared from the face of the earth. National Geographic, October of 08. What they may have looked like. We know what their skeletons were like. Oh, she's asking about similarities between Artie and Lucy. I don't know without going back to look. Your school takes science? You don't have it in the school library. Or you can Google already and get all that stuff. Yeah. But if your school has science, that's that weekly, they would have it, October 2nd. I'd have to go look. Hey, we do know from the initial Neanderthal evaluation of first million base pairs, they have a gene called MC1R. That affects pigmentation. And that means they probably were fair complected with reddish hair. And of course, you know, anthropologists have always wondered if Neanderthals could talk. What would you look for? Fox P2. They have the human version of Fox P2, so very likely they were able to communicate through speech. Or on the subject, another group of people strangely disappeared from the face of the earth, July of 1918. 